Good morning. This is Alana Mueller with Compton Fast Track. Welcome to the July edition of the Compton Fast Track Author Series. It's a pleasure to have you. This morning, I'm very pleased to welcome my friend Craig Wortman to our author series. He's the author of What's Your Story? As founder and CEO of Sales Engine, Craig and his team help, build, help firms build and tune their sales engine. Craig's firm works with teams all over the world to develop their knowledge, skill, and discipline and translate those key assets into higher performance. As a clinical professor of entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, my own alma mater, Craig designed, developed, and teaches the award-winning course called Entrepreneurial Selling, recently recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 10 courses in the country. He also teaches Building the New Venture and a course on leadership called Personal Leadership Insights for the Executive Education Program. He's the recipient of the 2012 Faculty Excellence Award for Teaching. In his capacity with Chicago Booth, tra Craig travels the globe teaching and motivating leaders, business executives, and alumni about the nuances and core competencies of each of his classes. Craig's book looks at how leaders and sales professionals use stories to connect, inspire, and overachieve. He demonstrates the powerful impact stories have on the three most common performance challenges, leadership, strategic selling, and motivation. Please join me in welcoming Craig Wortman to the author series. Thanks, Alana, for a great introduction. Uh, welcome everyone that's uh, on the webinar. I am delighted to be with you. Um, we're, we've got, a, I hope, a, 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 a fun, um, a, a fun hour ahead of us. With uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to build a case and uh, create an argument, and then take some questions at the end. And I hope to engage you in something that. What's interesting about this is I hope to engage you in something you already do, which is tell stories. Um, Alana gave a really nice background, and the only thing I would add to that is one of the things that I have discovered, um, which I I'm sure won't surprise any of you here, but one of the things I've discovered in my journey as a, as a professional salesperson, as an entrepreneur three times over, and now as a professor and entrepreneur, is that one of the things that humans do really well is tell stories. And I think that's probably obvious to each and every person on this webinar. Um, but I often am surprised by how we think about stories. And so what I'm going to do is try to build a case and an argument for why stories are powerful, what we should do with them, how we should capture and distill them, and why that's important. And what I'm going to try to do, and, and I hope to win at least some of you over with this argument, this case I'm going to build, is what I hope to do is, is have you walk away from this with an increased awareness of the stories that you already tell and an appreciation and maybe some strategies and a tool um, to capture and distill your most powerful stories. Because I fundamentally believe that the stories that you tell are your most powerful asset in business and, I guess, in life. So um, with that as a sort of a high-level start, um, let's dive in. Alana, can I, can I dive in and get going? I had to take myself off mute, guessing, absolutely. You're, guessing you're on. We're, we're set to go. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I should have known you were on mute. So great, so let's dive in. Um, I'm guessing, since I haven't heard from any of you, that you, you can see my screen. I'm sharing my screen with you. You should see a slide called Telling Your Story. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. The first thing I want to I want to do, and I'm going to I'm going to click to the next slide where you see three what I call three bubbles or three circles. I'm going to I'm going to try to provoke all of you right off the bat here, not in a negative way, of course, but I want to provoke your thinking a little bit, or maybe say something slightly controversial. I really believe that in my in my again as in my journey as a as an entrepreneur, I really think that our success in business and frankly our success in life is a combination of three hugely important things, and that is having the proper balance between knowledge, skill, and discipline. I don't think that in and of itself is controversial, but here's, here's my sort of provocative statement, number one of perhaps a few today. I think you have too much knowledge. And the reason I say that, before you, before you hang up and, and go off to your email, the reason I say that is, I, I, of course, what I don't mean is get dumber. I don't mean that, you know that. But what I do mean is there is a real psychological phenomenon known as the curse of knowledge, and we all have it. The, mo the more educated we get, the more experience we get as individuals and business leaders, 
the more knowledge we accumulate. And that, of course, is a wonderful thing. That circle, that bubble, if you will, gets bigger and bigger. But one of the things I like to talk about and one of the things I really learned you know, 25 years ago from my early sales career was my success is probably more um, tied to my ability to continually develop my skill and to continually hone my discipline. And it's something I've struggled with and I've read about and I've researched and I've worked on for the last 25 years and specifically for the last six in my teaching. And frankly, Alana was kind enough to mention the, the Inc. Magazine um, recognition that we've gotten for this booth course that I teach on entrepreneurial selling. I frankly think that's why Inc. Magazine got so interested in the course, is that the course is all around skill and discipline which is not something you necessarily associate with an MBA course. You think of knowledge, right? You think of me standing in the classroom and making you read a bunch of stuff and making you accumulate a bunch of knowledge. And it, and it sounds like I'm disparaging that. And I, I'm, I hope I'm not coming across that way or too snarky on this. But I really mean this. I think that we as professionals really need to think long and hard about the skill we're bringing to each situation and perhaps each high stakes situation. You know, we don't have to think too hard about the low stakes situations we're in. We've got to be thinking about what are the skills that I'm bringing and how am I continually developing that? And what is the role of discipline in my day or week or month? Of course we have to think about accumulating knowledge. You wouldn't be here on this webinar if you weren't curious and interested in accumulating knowledge. And I salute each and every one of you. And that's good. It's a good thing. But I want to suggest to you that this thing you already do, this storytelling, this harnessing your most powerful stories and impacting and inspiring and motivating people with stories that you already do is as much a skill and a discipline as it is a knowledge. And so I, 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 I won't belabor this, but please keep that in mind as you're going through and listening to this and then interacting as we take questions. Please keep this framework in mind. Um, I think it's really important. So that's, 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 um, that's sort of the framework we're going to use to set this up. Now, let's talk about the problem because we, you know, we can't talk about a solution uh, until we address the problem. I'd sort of do this maybe in a crazy way, but I'm going to show you this little stick figure. Um, that's you, that's me, that's Alana, that's the Kaufman, that's everybody you come across is that person in the middle of this crazy drawing. And this is, I will admit to you right off the bat, this is a six-year-old chart from my book. Um, that is hopelessly wrong and out of date. Um, you know, the question I always ask is, how many people, you know, brought your PDA to this meeting? And, you know, and everybody's sort of rolling their eyes like, Craig, come on, with the PDA, right? Nobody refers to it as a PDA anymore. And that is exactly my point. One of my points here is, think for a second about where you get information, right? You get information from all these sources. I won't read them to you, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of things on here. And, and, and this is hopelessly wrong and out of date. So look at, the, look at the right side. You know, all these are sort of web-enabled or smartphone-enabled things. But the question here, one of the natural questions you should be asking, and some of you have undoubtedly already noticed, is what is this missing? The right side of this, of course, is missing Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, the social universe, right? And, and, and the reason for that is very mundane. The reason for that is those things, I mean, Facebook, I guess, was around six years ago when I wrote my book, but it certainly wasn't in my consciousness. I guess I'd probably heard of it. I don't really know. Twitter wasn't around, really. And you know, some of these more newer technologies that you and, and I rely on now weren't around. And so where we get information, the list gets longer and longer. And, and, and please don't misunderstand me. This is not, you know, I am not launching into an anti-technology, you know, dissertation here. Not at all. I'm a nerd. I love technology. I love tweeting and experimenting with Quora and, and, and LinkedIn and, and Facebook and all of these sorts of things. But the natural question is, when you accumulate more and more information and when you check more and more sources of information, what do you give up? And I think the answer is, you know, it, it, partly privacy um, on some levels, and we're not going to talk about that. I know nothing about the privacy uh, sector of this biz, of this industry. But one of the things you often give up is time, and I I don't think you know we have we all have 24 hours in a day. I think the time just shifts, and and you know on some level I think that's okay, but I also think that the nature of our interactions change and they shift. 
and they get parsed and they get sliced more and more thinly. And I think if we're honest with each other, I think what happens is, you know, every minute you spend on LinkedIn or Facebook, again, those aren't bad, bad minutes necessarily, unless you're wasting time, and we all have done that, but they're not bad minutes. You're not being unproductive, but you are shifting the nature of your communications. You're shifting the nature of your interactions, and I think what happens is, you know, one of the things that's, of course, missing from this chart is other people. You get information from other people. I think that gets sliced more and more thinly. And so the question I like to ask is, then with the remaining interactions you have with people, like this on a webinar, one-to-one -one if I run into you in the street, you know, one-to-many if we have a meeting at your office, whatever it is, are you thinking consciously about how you can, how you can increase the richness of that interaction? If the time you have left with people is getting sliced more and more thinly, how are you thinking about the content of those interactions? And of course, I think, and I'm you know, totally biased on this, I will admit to all of you, I think one of the things that we need to think about is if, if we're slicing time ever more thinly, then we really have to increase the richness of our interaction and the effectiveness of that outcome. So with that said, you know, one of the ways to think about this is you know, this is just me being a little bit snarky, but here's where your mom got information all of the stuff on the right is missing. She didn't have access to the web. She didn't have LinkedIn. She didn't have Facebook. She didn't have a smartphone. Was she completely dysfunctional and unable to you know, function in business because she lacked information? Of course not. But yet here we are. We have all these things and more and more because this is hopelessly outdated. And it's just a natural question to ask. So I'll, I'll leave it there. But it's just I want to provoke you to think about the content of your interactions and don't take those for granted. We kind of are this pilot in this cockpit. We have our devices and our data sets arrayed all around us. And again, of course, that's a good thing. These are productivity devices at the end of the day. But what you can't see in this crazy little picture that, that I cut is you can't see the windshield. You can't see where you're going. And one of the things that stories do so powerfully and better than any other communications device you have is they pick up our chins and we look at each other and we can motivate and inspire and connect with each other and create a more rich channel for communications. That's what I'm suggesting here. And again, I'm suggesting you already do this. Okay, so let's keep going. You know, this is just a funny thing. One of the things that we've learned from folks like Daniel Kahneman, the guy who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, if you haven't read that book, I would put it somewhere near the top of your priority list. He's an incredible scholar. He's a, he writes in a very uh, accessible manner. And thinking fast and slow got me thinking in another way about stories. You know, one of the things he tells us is that we, you know, we have these two systems, system one and system two. And forgive me if, I, if you've read the book and I mix these up. But system one is your conscious mind. System two is your unconscious mind. And what Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for was suggesting to us that we actually make a hell of a lot more decisions in our unconscious mind than we do in our conscious mind. And we are, as rational beings, we're, we are mostly resistant to that notion. We say, no, we make, you know, we're rational beings. I make a decision to you know, buy a car in my rational mind. It's a rational decision. And Kahneman says, no, it's not. It's an emotional decision. And get over it, right? And the great way he illustrated this in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech he literally said, okay, group, you know, and I, it'd be like me saying this to you, what's two plus two? And of course, if I could hear you, you would say four without even thinking. And that's exactly the point. And I would say, okay, that's great. Four is the correct answer. Well done. What's 137 times 68? And then you all stare at me, and you would try to crank that math. And you'd get the answer, and you know, most of you'd be right, and you'd be fine. That the difference between system one and system two. You don't think about two plus two. It's unconscious. It's not necessarily an emotional decision, but it's unconscious. You just know it. 137 times 68, that has to go to your math brain. It has to be transferred in your brain to the math part. You crank it, you come back with the answer. And the genius of Daniel Kahneman is he's helping all of us realize, and brain science is helping us realize that we make decisions much more emotionally than we think we do. In fact, we probably make 90 plus percent of our decisions emotionally. And if you accept that, and you know, some people are really resistant to this, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a nerd about stories anyway, so I, I sort of love Daniel Kahneman because he's convincing even more of us to accept this notion that we make decisions emotionally. Well, if, if that's true, 
then what is the best tool for speaking to people's emotions? Stories. Stories are the best tool, right? So, so that's, that's the beginning of my case here, and we'll, and we'll keep going through this. So, you know, th this is sort of controversial, but if you, if you think about it, and advertising, advertising companies do this research, they di they, they've, dif they've discovered that most people, and mostly men, I will pick on the guys in this group, mostly men, they make decisions, they, they read the car advertisements after they bought the car. Why? To rationalize the decision, to make it conscious why they bought that car, because typically they bought that car emotionally. They just did it because they wanted to, and there was some emotional reaction to that car. There are many, 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 many examples of this. Um, there's a group in London of, uh, that I just met with in London, fast, fascinating market research group that went out and looked at the most award-winning advertisements and the most effective advertisements over the last five decades all over the world. And they judged effectiveness, efficacy, by how much they increased the top line. So these were, you know, this is dollars and cents, measurable advertising impact from these ads. And they put them in three groups. Entirely rational ads, you give me the facts, you give me the features, I make a decision. And that's what you're featured on the ad. Purely emotional sale and somewhere in between. And let me just give you an example of sort of a purely emotional sale that some, I think most of you will remember. A couple of Super Bowls ago, Volkswagen did an ad where the little kid is dressed up in the Darth Vader uh, outfit and he's trying to animate all these objects like Darth Vader would, and he's failing miserably, and he's sort of emotional about it. And then the dad drives into the driveway this beautiful car and gets out of the car, and it turns out you can turn on the engine from inside the car with the key fob. And the kid is outside trying to start the car. You all remember this, right? And he sort of waves his hands at the car, and the dad starts the engine from inside the house. And finally, the kid has been successful, and it's just, it's just it's very emotional. I mean, maybe there's one feature. The feature is you can turn the car on from the inside of the house. Like, who cares? Who actually does that? It is a purely emotional play. Well, it's one of the most popular advertisements of all time. And what this research firm found in London is that, hands down, the most effective financially, the most effective advertisements were the ones that were purely emotional, not purely rational, and not a mix, not a mix of emotion and rationality. And that probably bothers some of you. And you know what? Guess what? It bothers me too. I'm a teacher. I'm a professor. I have to have facts and figures. Here's another way to look at it. This is my most labor-intensive slide of this talk. Just take a second and read this. I'll give you a second. Read this, in, this quote from Annette Simmons. If some of you are looking away or otherwise predisposed, I'll read it for you. She says, facts are neutral until human beings add their own meaning to those facts. The meaning they add to those facts depends on their current story. People stick with their story even when presented with facts that don't fit. They simply interpret or discount the facts to fit their story. This is why facts are not terribly useful in influencing others. Folks, this is a very, very provocative quote. I took this quote. If you get interested in the story stuff, I hope you do. I hope you will check out Annette Simmons' book called The Story Factor. Very powerful book. That's where this quote came from, dead center in that book. This is very provocative. Most people, including me, are troubled by this quote because facts are facts. They're the objective truth. And it's hard to argue with facts, yet you and I do it every single day. And what Simmons is suggesting in this quote is that if you're going to err in your communications, you should err on the side of story. That makes many of us very uncomfortable, like, wait a second. I'm going to tell this fluffy story, and that's going to be more convincing than the facts. And Daniel Kahneman's research, and Annette Simmons, and many, many others, David Brooks, and many others would suggest, yes. The answer to that question is unequivocally, yes. A bunch of you right now are saying, come on, Craig, there is no way that that is true, because facts are facts. And what I would argue with you is, I think in some limited situations, you're right, facts, you know, the facts are the facts, and when the facts are exceedingly clear and uncontroversial, you probably are right. But if you think about your work, and you think about the complexity of leading people, selling people, motivating people, those situations are not simple. 
and I'm going to line up the facts the way that I was brought up depending on my own world view and nothing you can say about the facts is going to convince me. It's just they, 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 they are decontextualized. Facts are just facts and I can line, up and line them up any way I want. You all know this, right? We all, you know, we all know the line about statistics lying, right? It's the same case with facts and I think Simmons is giving us a powerful, the beginnings of a powerful argument here that we should be thinking more consciously and more deliberately and more intentionally about the stories we tell and not just relying on facts and evidence. There's another way to sort of position this. Um, well, let me jump back here for a second. There's another way to position this that I want to mention before I move on. There was some interesting research done in 1997 where three researchers, two men, uh, two women, sorry, and a man at Carnegie Mellon University walked into the undergrad student center at Carnegie Mellon. And they said to the undergrads who were there, they said, hey, we're conducting a survey on how you use technology. And we'd like to, to give you a survey, and, and we know surveys are a pain, and this will only take six to eight minutes of your time. And for your trouble, we'll give you five bucks. So, you know, hundreds of undergrad college students, you know, seeing five bucks and a beer in their immediate future said, hey, no problem, we'll take the survey. So they got lots of people to take the survey. They marched them down to a room. They conducted this survey on how you use technology. And then two college students, you know, Craig and Alana, would walk out together. And Craig would look at Alana, his buddy, and say, hey, Alana, did you just take that, uh, that survey that they did on technology? And Alana would say, yeah, Craig, I, I did. And, and hey, Craig, um, did, did you give any money to save the children and Rokia? And the college student Craig would look at his friend Alana and say, what are you talking about? I, I, yeah, I gave some money to save the children, but what's this thing, Rokia? What does that mean? I don't understand what you're saying. And Alana would say, well, see, Craig, in my envelope with my five bucks after I took the survey, they handed me the envelope. In my envelope, there was a pledge form from Save the Children. And it told a story about Rokia, this nine-year-old girl who's living in Malawi, Africa, and she's dying of a waterborne illness. And the waterborne illness is entirely treatable. And it just told a couple of things about her and then said Save the Children. And it was a pledge form. And it was wrapped around my five bucks. So I gave them some money. Didn't, didn't you give them some money, Craig? And then I say, that's funny, Alana, because in my envelope with my five bucks, there was also a pledge form from Save the Children. And it said, my pledge form said, you know, in Malawi, Africa, on an annual basis, there are 9 million cases of waterborne illness. There are 11 million cases of malaria. They are all entirely treatable, blah, 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 Save the Children. And yeah, Alana, I gave them some money too. This was not a project, it was not research about technology at all. That was a ruse. It was research about the efficacy of story versus fact. And it had some very powerful results. This thing has been repeated over and over and over again. And please, I hope none of you get lost in the charitable aspect of this. It has nothing to do with charity. You can do this with a Ford. You can do this with a pair of sunglasses. It doesn't make any difference. The research result is the same. And what's really clever about the research is the, they gave to these groups of undergrads, when they do this experiment over and over, they give them $5 bills. Instead of a $5 bill, they give them five $1 bills, which is really clever if you think about it. And here's what happened. So Alana, if I got my facts, my, my story straight here, Alana got the story from Save the Children. And the question I'm asking all of you on this webinar is, how much money did she give? Considering loose change, how much money did she give? And, I, and obviously, we'll, I, I will do this sort of unilaterally here. It turns out, on average, experiment after experiment, she gave an average of $2.38, accounting for change in her pocket and students like her. And then the obvious question is, what did I give? What did the fact-based pledge yield? And the research, um, again, the average on the research was $1.14. So the fact-based pledge yielded the dollar fourteen. The story-based pledge yielded two dollars and thirty-eight cents, and I think that is profound, right? Think about that for a second. I essentially told they essentially told you exactly nothing about Rokia. They they have this name. They have you know she's nine years old. You really know nothing about her because they just gave you a little tiny play of where she lived and how old she is, and the fact that she's dying. And then I gave you 9 million cases, 11 million cases, which that's a fact, right? 
most of us walking into that situation would be would would think that the facts would be terribly influential. And what we know about this quote from Simmons, this argument that she's making, is that's absolutely the exact opposite. Now, all of you as adults, you know why this happens. You know why it happens. It happens because that story connects to your emotion. I told you nothing about Rokia, yet you can picture her. I didn't give you a picture, yet you can see her in your mind's eye. I told you how old she is, you connected that. She's a child. Same deal as the Volkswagen commercial. Same deal. You can't connect to 9 million and 11 million. You can't do it. Facts are not influential. And I'm sure some of you are still shaking your head. But the va I mean, this is an experiment that's been repeated over and over. You are quite literally leaving money on the table if you're not telling people stories. Now, let's extend this argument even further. Some of you, I'm sure, are thinking, okay, fine, Craig, fine, I get it. Stories are powerful, I get it. But you gotta have facts. And by the way, I agree, I'm a teacher. I walk into the classroom a few times a week and I try to do what I just did, give you research, which is facts. Now notice something, I told you those facts in the form of a story. Right? I'm sure you all noticed that. I do that for a reason. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, Craig, I get it. But wouldn't it just be more powerful to do both? I mean, you and Simmons are here harping on us about how stories have to, you know, they have to be told. And you'd be right, but wouldn't you just be better off, better served telling facts and stories? Turns out they did this experiment another way. Alana and Craig walk out. Alana says, you give any money to Rokia and save the children? And I say, yes, I know exactly what she's talking about. But they've changed the experiment just slightly. This time, Alana got only the story just like last time. So we know what she did. She gave 238. This time, instead of just getting 9 million, 11 million, and just the facts, I got both. I got Rokia and the facts, or the facts and Rokia. The order doesn't matter. Now what do you think happened? We know what Alana did. She gave 238. What did I do? Turns out I gave a dollar 41. Gave a dollar 14 last time. Gave a dollar forty-one this time, so I gave more. So the facts had some influence, but not as much as story. Now I will be honest with all of you. I'm sort of troubled by this result, right? I wanted to be more than story, but it's not. And I think Daniel Kahneman, I think folks like Simmons, Brooks, folks that research even brain science is showing us that because stories do two things really, really well. They add context and they connect to our emotions, they're more powerful. And so that's, that's the, the, the heart of the case I'm making to you is those two things. Facts are devoid often, mostly, of context, and they have no emotion. They're just facts. It's a, fact's not, you know, a fact can be emotional, I guess, but it's not an emotional, it's not the way that people normally connect to emotion, which is through characters. We're human beings. We connect to other human beings. I told you nothing about Rokia, yet she connects to you somehow. She connects to your heart and your head, and it actually, when they look at brains, it actually fires more places in your brain than just the facts do. So I think that's what we're talking about. One last word on, I'll leave emotion for now, but one last word on context, and I'll show you this crazy chart. Don't even worry about the words on this chart. You don't even have to read them. My point here is that here's you on the left. Here are the people on the right that you're trying to impact, right, with your communications. And you, something happens to you, that little story, right? You, you want to convince people that we should be more ethical, or you want to convince people to really push up that hill and accomplish those stretch goals at work, or sell more, or be better leaders, or whatever, right? And you have this experience, and then what happens is this natural process of distilling down our communications from left to right through a series of filters. You know, the first, if I had to do this again from my book, I would have done it differently. The first filter is sort of social emotional, like, can I share this? Can I say this out loud, right? Can I tell this story? You know, can I tell this joke? Whatever it is. And then the next one is, you know, maybe legal filters, maybe HR filters, maybe leadership filters, all the way down to, to the right where I say, okay, webinar audience, here's what you need to know about stories. It's two things. They're, they give context and emotion. They connect to emotion. Now go tell stories. But what have I done? I've done something that is useful. I've, by, for efficacy and efficiency's sake, I've distilled a whole big hour-long argument down to two clear points. 
tell stories because they connect to context and they connect to emotion. Done. But that doesn't really impact you. It doesn't do anything, right? This is a, well, the reason I call this a natural progression is you're going to do this anyway. I do this. We all do this. We've got to get it down. You've got to walk into a group of people for an hour, and you've got to make two clear points. Here's my point, though. You've got to reverse this process. If you draw an arrow from, you know, must be written by legal counsel and must comply with state and federal law, or stories give context and connect to emotion, or whatever your two or three clear bullet points are, draw an arrow from those backwards, go to a story and hang a story on those two clear points, hang a story on the facts, just like I did with the research at Carnegie Mellon that I told you about a minute ago. That's what I'm asking you to think about. But now that begs a really hard question. Where are the stories? And I think that's, you know, that's why I wanted to talk to you all today is I don't think we're very good at that, me included. I mean, I'm working on this for years, and I'm still getting good at this. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's just say I walk into my classroom. I taught in Chicago last night for three hours. I walk into my classroom. I'm going to make a whole bunch of points over three hours. Have I equipped myself with a story that I know from the research will connect to your emotion and will give you context? And if I haven't done it, I have not done my job. And that's my fault. It's nobody's fault but mine. And I just, and so I'm, I'm getting nuts here, folks, because I fundamentally believe that as a leader in any of any stripe, you have to be doing this. It is your responsibility. We know this from research. You've got to walk into those situations. And I'm not suggesting that you only tell stories. God, no. That would be obnoxious and annoying. Just like if you only stated the facts, you'd be obnoxious. But there's an appropriate balance here, and I don't know what it is, but you've got to equip yourself with stories. You've got to walk into that situation, that three-hour class or that 20-minute meeting or that two-minute hallway conversation, and if you've got one thing to say, you say it, and then you hang a story on it. But you've got to have the stories, right? You've got to have them. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the solution. We talked about context and emotion. I talked about Save the Children. One last thing I want to say, and we'll jump to the solution, is think about them this way. Think about context this way. I don't know if anybody's been, I'm sure some of you have been to a Japanese garden. They're all over the world. They are some of the world's most beautiful places. This is the Botanic Garden in Chicago. I go to Japanese gardens. I'm a bit of a nerd about that. I love these. And one of the reasons I love them is there's a philosophical element of every Japanese garden called a zigzag bridge. This is in the Chicago Botanic Garden zigzag bridge. And the philosophy behind this, I think, is very profound. If, from the perspective of the photographer, the photographer, which in this case is me, that's my little son across the way there, the, the photograph is taken from the mainland. And my son is standing on an island. And the philosophy in Japanese, in the, the, the concept in Japanese philosophy is the, philosophy, the, the mainland represents where you are in your life as a leader. The island represents where you want to go as a leader. You're la life's ambition, if you will. And the zigzag bridge is structured such to slow you down, to take in the beauty that's all around you. That's the philosophical element of the Japanese garden. I think that's very powerful, and you know, we're not going to have a philosophical discussion. What I love about it is that's a metaphor for stories. Stories slow us down ever so slightly, ever so slightly, to take in what's going around, what's going on around us, the context of the thing. Doesn't mean we'll agree does not mean I will convince you with every story, but it gives you a chance to see context, and that's powerful. But how do you do this, right? Yeah, these are just some things, and we will leave your, you know, Alana, I'm sure we'll make this, uh, we're going to make this deck available to you, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through some things, because I want to show you a tool that, is, that I call the story matrix, and this is one of my many story matrices. This is in my book, What's Your Story? There's a whole chapter about the story matrix in Chapter 5, and I just want to show this to you. I know this looks like a little bit of an eye chart. It's actually very simple. It's all only a spreadsheet. It's just a grid with cells. And here's the question that I'm asking. So if you buy two-thirds of this argument, you say, okay, okay, Craig, I got you. I'm going to walk into the next high-stakes situation, and I'm going to equip myself with a story. How do you do that, right? First of all, what types of stories do you tell? And how do you categorize those stories so that they're readily available to you? Well. To answer the first question first, if you look at the columns here, I have four. Success, failure, fun, and legends. 
I believe that each one of us on this on this webinar tells four types, or should be telling four types of stories. You know what these are. Success stories are obvious. Failure stories are obvious. Fun stories are obvious. Legends, maybe not so much. I mean, legends are probably what you're thinking. You know, once upon a time, sort of teaching stories, stories from history, stories from religion, stories from culture, spirituality, wherever. Legends, the big sort of heavy stories that you tell uh, occasionally or that you read or you see movies about. There's another definition of legends that are equally, um, equally relevant here. A story about Marion Kaufman starting his first business, going door to door, driving around hospitals in St. Louis, right? Or stories about Steve Jobs launching the iPhone or the early Mac, right? Stories about Anita Roddick launching the body shop. There are many, many legends out there, and you all know these stories because we all swim in the same business culture. So those are the definitions of, that's the definition of legends, right? Now, before we get to categories, I'm going to ask you another provocative question, and I'll, it's rhetorical, obviously, because I'll, I'll give you my opinion, but just think about this for a second. If you buy my argument and you say, okay, Craig, I'm going to get good at this storytelling thing, and I'm going to be more, a more effective leader through telling stories, I, I got you, I'm going to do it. If I could wave my magic wand after this webinar and at you know, 11 o'clock Central Time, you left this webinar, and for the next six months, you could only tell one type of story, what would it be? Success, failure, fun, or, not and, or legends. Now you know what I'm asking you to do is tell all four types, but just artificially here, what if you were to tell one type, I could wave my magic wand and you could only tell one type and you had to choose? And it's interesting. So rhetorically, I'm gonna answer the question, right? It's interesting. It's usually a mix of success, failure, and fun. People are less comfortable with legends. One of the answers I get with legends is, Craig, I should tell legends for the next six months because they kind of encompass all the rest of the three types. And, the, and you would be right. I mean, that would be, that would be an interesting way to think about it. One of the risks, and you know, we don't have time to fully explore this, but one of the risks in telling stories and telling legend type stories is that they're very heavy. If I told you a legend right now, I'm asking a lot of you. I'm asking you to go with me on a, on a, on a short journey. They tend to be heavier types of stories. You've got to be really careful with heavy stories in business because they can go bad on you. you. I can turn into a caricature. I tell you a legend, you're like, oh, my God, Craig, stop already, right? You sort of roll your eyes at me. And that's not a good thing. That, that makes me less powerful, less influential, less convincing, less persuasive. And then... Most people say, well, you know, it's a mix of yeah, success because they're motivational, failure because they demonstrate humility, fun because they're fun, they're lighthearted, we've got to have fun at work. And all of those arguments are right, and that's exactly why you tell all types. Here's my vote for if you had to choose one, if you've got to err, I say err on the side of failure. And I'm sure that surprises some of you. It's like, wait a minute, Craig, what? I'm going to tell failure stories for the next six months? Are you out of your mind? And I don't think so. And I want to make sure you understand, I am not saying that the definition of failure stories are, you know, Craig says, look what a moron I am stories. Some of them can be like that. They tend to be in the fun category, the look what a moron I am. I made this stupid thing. I fell down the stairs. I opened the cab, and the cab door got ripped off by another cab. I mean, just funny stories, right, of failure. I think failure is our most powerful type of leadership story because we demonstrate vulnerability, humility, humbleness, and we connect to emotion. Failure stories are the most powerful emotional stories. Let me give you a, a stupid example. I come into this webinar. None of you know me. I get on the phone and I start talking to you about stories and you don't know who Craig is and I tell you the five greatest hit success stories of Craig. What do you think about me after about three nanoseconds? I'm arrogant, I'm a total jerk, and you hang up and walk away and go to the next webinar. That's what you would all do. And you would do it for good reason. Now, I understand that the converse is also true. If I showed up at this webinar and, you know, Alana gave me this beautiful introduction and then I told you my five tragic failure stories of Craig, of which I have about 500 on my story matrices, you would probably be like horrified after the third story and be like, why are we listening to this guy again, right? And I get that, but here's the difference. I think you would listen all the way through. At some point it would turn into like watching a train wreck, I get that, but you would listen. If, as soon as I started my second success story, you'd be gone. You would say, this guy's a jerk, and you would leave. 
And I think therein lies the lesson. I know I'm setting it up artificially, but and, I, and I'm not trying to convince you, of course, to only tell failure stories. I just use that as a construct to try to convince you that of your most powerful tool, which is stories, the most powerful type are your failure stories. I had a teaching assistant a couple years ago who was a master's in education from Stanford. She was one of my MBA students, incredible young woman. She counted the stories I told over my 30-hour entrepreneurial selling class. 70, over 70% 70 of them were failure stories. Most of those were my own failures. And there's a reason for that. I'm not trying to say I'm an idiot. I'm just trying to say, guys, if you're looking at raising money, or you're looking at lead gen, or you're looking at leading people, or preparation, here is not the way to do it. Here's when I failed at this. Because if I tell you a success, you know, it's great. You get to see how it is, and I tell those too. Or if I tell you a funny story, you just lighten the mood, and it's fun, and you get some value out of that. You get context, and I connect to your emotion. But if I really want to punch it, if I want to hammer it hard, I want to crush it, I'm going to tell you a failure story because you are going to listen to that story. I can promise you. It's going to fire more areas of your brain, and you will remember it. And three weeks from now, you're not going to remember what was on my third slide in this webinar. But you might remember the Save the Children story. You might remember that. And if I can do that, I've succeeded. I've succeeded. And that, that's what this is about. It's about being more persuasive and more convincing and, and more powerful. So let me give you an example of this. So, and, and, and so let me finish the thought, though. Sorry. I, I, I neglected to go through the, the, the rows, right? You see the rows here. This is just one story matrix from one of my classes at one of my sessions in my selling class. We talk about prep. We talk about lead gen. We talk about raising money, et cetera. These are a few of my stories. And oftentimes, when I'm both inside of Chicago Booth or I'm working in consulting outside of Chicago Booth with sales teams, one of the things that comes across all the time, one of the things that comes up is just preparation. And let's just say, let's just argument for argument's sake, again, artificial construct here, you're all a sales team. You're an in-tech sales team. I'm talking to 100 people on a sales team at whatever, pick your company, and you're all the sales people, and I'm talking to you, and I say something to you like, folks, you know, one of the things that comes from research that, that differentiates high-performing salespeople like you from low to moderate-performing salespeople is in the quality of your preparation. So you really got to be prepared for every sales meeting. Now, full stop, each and every one of you on this webinar knows what I mean. I don't have to explain that. There's not a huge knowledge component. You all know how to prepare for a sales meeting. It's not rocket science. It also has no impact on you. What I just said is a fact. Get prepared. We know that more prepared salespeople succeed better in sales meetings. Duh. Everybody on this webinar knows that. OK, that's option one. Option two is, I say to you as an in-tax team of 100, hey, team, we all know that high performers, blah, 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 succeed more than, than low performers when they prepare more. When I was selling for IBM 25 years ago, I covered 13 zip codes on the south side of Chicago. And one of the, one of the zip codes, there was a company called Cornell Forge. Do you know what a forge is? And most people don't know what a forge is. A forge is, a, in this case, a drop forge. A forge is a company that, in this case, made metal golf club heads, and they make them by dropping a 40-ton piece of equipment, three stories. It bangs out. It just punches these metal golf club heads out of a die, and they off they go. Well, I went down to call on Cornell Forge, and I called on the president. This guy's a third-generation president of this company. He's probably been wandering around this plant since he was three years old. And I'm Mr. IBMer in my blue suit and my red tie looking sharp with my shiny shoes, and I open my briefcase, and I start selling this guy. And about 12 minutes into the conversation, the forge drops. The drop forge falls. 40 tons of equipment fall four, three, four stories and punch out a metal golf club head. And it turns out that the forge is about 30 feet behind me through the conference room wall that I can't see. And I had no idea what Cornell Forge made or did, nor did I care. It's a junior salesman. And this thing punched out those golf club heads. And I am here to tell you that when a 40-ton piece of equipment falls, four stories and lands abruptly, it makes an unbelievable sound. And I jumped up out of my chair thinking, of course, we were under some form of attack. And the guy's looking at me like, what the hell is your problem? And I said, oh my god, what was that? And he said, Craig, you don't know what a forge does, do you? And I said, no. What do you think happened next? He showed me the door in my crisp IBM blue suit and my red tie. 
and I'm literally kicked out on the street on the south side of Chicago. Now, full stop again, I just told you a quick story. It's an actual true story. That actually happened to me. Yes, was I a moron? Of course I was. I just, I, I should have spent five seconds asking one of our engineers or somebody looking in the phone book, hey, what does Cornell Forge do? And I would have at least been mildly intelligent walking into the meeting. I fundamentally believe that if you do option one and say, guys, we know from research that you got to prepare, those are the facts. If you leave it there, most people will not remember what you just said. If you go with option B, I think you're better, I know you're better served. And I believe that even on this webinar a couple weeks from now, some small subset of you, or maybe I hope a larger subset of you, will remember my crazy drop forge story. And that's how this works. So if I go to the next slide, of course, you click on drop forge, and there's the story that I just told you. And if you want to go all the way with this stuff, and, and, and I'm going to wrap up right now, if you want to go all the way with this stuff, you, can, you write down the story, and you don't have to use an app like this. Just write it down anywhere. Put it in your BlackBerry. Put it in your iPhone. Write it on a piece of paper. Write down the story. Write down a lesson and an application. And now you're off and running in creating your quiver of arrows that hang on your back, your metaphorical quiver of arrows that are so critical when it comes to persuading and convincing and inspiring people. So let me stop there with our... Our, uh, our, our formal piece and, and ask you if you have any questions. I'd love to take any questions that you have. Craig, thank you so much. Um, for our audience, if you will type in your question into the questions box, uh, I will share those questions with Craig. We do have a couple of questions. Please. The first one is, um, one of our participants has asked, I would like to know what books have inspired Craig. And Craig, I know you mentioned Thinking Fast and Slow and Story Factor. Are there other books that have inspired you or that you would recommend to our audience? You betcha. That's a great question. So I'm going to give you two, uh, three options, right? I can't, I, I would be remiss as an author not to plug my own book. So there's What's Your Story. That's where all this stuff is from. What's Your Story. I love the story factor um, and uh, thinking fast and slow. I've got a couple of current favorites for you that I'll suggest, um, oddly, by the same guy. I was lucky enough to speak um, week before last to the Federal Reserve with Dan Pink. And Dan Pink wrote both The Whole New Mind, which I'm sure you've heard of, a crazy bestseller from a few years ago. That is a book I keep coming back to. It's, um, there's just a tremendous amount of wisdom in there. There's stuff about story, but it's not a, it's not a book about stories. It's a book um, that I think will inspire you. So if you haven't looked at A Whole New Mind, uh, pick that up. And I don't mean to be, I don't have a business relationship with Dan Pink, so I don't mean to be touting Dan Pink, but he just wrote another book that came out on January 1st called To Sell is Human. And I love that one too because it's talking about how, first of all, we're all in sales. And of course, that speaks to my own bias, and I'll admit that. I'm a salesman uh, at heart. Even as a professor, I'm still a salesman every day in many, many ways. And I think Dan makes a very convincing case, even for those of us who don't think of ourselves as salespeople, he makes an interesting case. He leverages a lot of interesting research around extroverts versus introverts and how we can better tune our skills in that area. Very powerful book, so I suggest that. And then finally, um, I obviously get asked this question a lot. And so on my blog, and I don't mean to be plugging my own blog, but there's just a great way to get this. If you just type into Google sales engine, which is my website, salesengine.com colon reading list, salesengine.com colon reading list, you'll pull up my entire reading list to sell as human, whole new mind, book reviews. We just did a book review of Chip and Dan Keith's book, Decisive, all kinds of stuff is there. And we try to, first of all, we never recommend a book we, hadn't, we haven't read ourselves. We do book reviews, and there's not a million. It's not like hitting Amazon where it's like, Craig, come on. It's a curated version of the question that you're asking. So hope that's helpful. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, can stories be used to sell projects internally as well as externally, and if so, how? Uh, you bet. I, I, think, I think they can. I think stories can be used in lots and lots of contexts. And at first I want to I do the, you know, the, 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 the cigarette pack warning, which is, you know, I mentioned this before, but I really want to hit this point so, so everyone understands. I'm a story nerd. I've written a whole book about this. I follow people like Simmons. But you know what? 
this is not a tool. It's not the tool. It's a tool. So I don't mean to portray that you tell stories at every turn. You, of course you don't do that. But selling something internally, yeah. I mean, what I would do is I would craft a couple of success and a couple of, of failure stories around past projects that have either been launched and failed or not been launched and, and thus were a missed opportunity or been launched and succeeded. And I would use that if I'm walking into a meeting with you and you're my team and I'm trying to convince you to launch a new project, I would say, you know, I, and again, this is me using both facts and story, but and sort of counteracting some, you know, counter uh, contradicting some of the research I just shared with you. But I would say, guys, you know, here are the three reasons why I think we ought to do this project. Now, then I would tell a story about a successful project that we launched and ask the question, what if we hadn't done that, right? And this really goes, and again, I'm sort of plugging my own book here, but chapter six of my book is about telling the stories in a way that you're intentional. It's not just about, you know, I tell you the drop forge story and I hope that you interpret that story in the way that, that I want you to, and that is to be prepared. I tell the story about that project that succeeded, and I say, guys, here's why I shared that story. I take, it all, I take my stories all the way. It's not just storytelling. There's you know, preparing and creating the quiver, creating the story matrix, if you will, telling the story, and then telling you why I told it. So guys, there's a reason I told that story. If we don't do this project, we'll have no chance at that success like that. Now let's talk about why that's true and why it might not be true. For all the reasons that we just suggested on this webinar, I think you're much, much better served by walking into that internal team and laying out the case and then telling the story. Much better served than just laying out the case mm -hmm. on its own. That's great. It, I, I think you sort of alluded to it with this latest answer, but the next question asks, what is the second most powerful story type? Ooh. That's a tough one. The short answer is I don't know. Um, the longer answer is probably success stories for the reason. So, and I'll talk about the other two types. So, fun stories, of course, are extremely powerful, right? I mean, one of the things I do when I speak to audiences, and I probably broke this rule today, so forgive me. But one of the things I do when I speak to audiences, I, you know, you you see any speaker, and they'll be funny. They'll try to be funny at places, not you know, unless you're a comedian. You know, they'll try to, it will try to stir it up. We're, we're, we're doing that because we want to create a range of emotion in the room. So we get dead serious, we lighten it up. Fun stories do that, very powerful. Legends are fantastic because they do encompass a lot of richness. So if I tell you a legend, there's just a lot there. There's tons of context, and I can pretty much guarantee it's going to connect to your emotion. The risk with fun stories is that if you do that too much, you risk turning into a caricature. And, and guys, I've done this, folks. I've done it. I, I like to tell fun stories. I have a lot of them. I can tell a version of the Drop Forge story that's really funny, and, and that's really fun for me to do because I get to try to be entertaining. And you know, who doesn't love that? It's just my, part of my personality. But if I tell you too many fun stories, most of you will kind of look at me after some point and go, Craig, come on. You know, don't, don't be the class clown. And then I've become ineffective, and I think there's a risk there. So I guess my short answer would be success stories, but here's the caveat. You, you, just like fun stories, there's a big risk in success stories of, of crossing that sort of look at me line, right? You know, I'm, I'm the best, look at this. When I tell success stories, I often tell success stories about other people. And then I tell failure stories about myself. And I love that combination. And I love that sort of 70 failure, 30 success combination or, and I don't know what the combination is, but, you know, 70 failure, you know, uh, 25, uh, 20 success and five and five legend and fun. If I, if I had to create a, 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 Zen, a Venn diagram, that's what it would be. Thank you. Um, Craig, the next question is, what are your insights into distilling lots of data and information into stories? Um, it's hard, uh, but it's doable. So, you know, one of the, probably the biggest trend in business right now is how do we make meaning out of data? You know, you can't swing a cat without hitting an article about big data anymore. And I think it's cool. I think that's great. I'm a story guy. So my natural question is, great, make meaning for me. Talk to me. What does that mean? What does it mean that the millennials make decisions in different ways than Gen Xers? That's fine. You got the data. Tell me what it means. And I think the hard work of story is, and, and I, I 
you know, this may be entirely lame for the person who asked this question, but my suggestion is ask the people who are collecting the data, what does that mean? Tell it to me in a story. Tell me about a millennial who actually made a decision and tell me about a Gen X who would have made a completely different decision. Tell me that story about that individual because I know that Rokia is more powerful than 9 million. So stop telling me about the 9 million and start telling me about Rokia. And I just, you know, this, is maybe, this may be an empty, lame answer, but my, my hope is that if you ask that question, the people who are truly good at the data can tell you that story. Guys, I know this. I work with surgeons. I work with CFOs. You, know, you think of CFOs, they're numbers people, right? Not the best ones. The best ones are storytellers. The best ones can go, Craig, hell yeah, I can tell you that balance sheet story. I can tell you the balance sheet in a story. Here's the story of this business. They are suffering, and here's why. And they can tell a story. And I go, oh my God, how do you do that? I want to learn how to do that. Right? Unbelievably powerful. The surgeon can look at a bunch of symptoms. I've, I just worked with, sur I've worked with 500 surgeons last week in Denver. Surgeons, the best ones, can go, okay, here are the nine presenting symptoms. Here is the story of the last two years of this person's life. And you go, oh my God, how do you do that? Right? How do you do that? My job as a teacher is to do the exact same thing except with entrepreneurial selling or leadership or building a new venture. That's our challenge, folks. That is the challenge. Craig, one, one final question. And the truth is we have many more questions. So what I think I'll do is I'll, I'll send you um, these questions separately. Maybe we can answer them offline. But one more question for the full group. Are there any apps that you particularly like for preparing and using stories? Well, you know, totally selfishly, folks, here, the Story Matrix app is available if you want it. Uh, that's the one I'm showing to you right now. So I'll reverse the slide here if you can still see the slides. This is a, 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 an app. It's, I will admit to all of you it's version one. We're implementing this at a, at a variety of companies. Um, and I would love to talk to you about it. It's, it's free. It's free right now. It, someday it won't be. But we're, we're in, um, if you know, if you study entrepreneurship, we're in sort of minimum viable product stage. So we're experimenting with this. We're trying to find product market fit. I'd be delighted and encouraged if anybody wanted to bang on this and use it to collect their stories. It's the only one I know of, frankly, um, and this is not you know, me marketing to you all, but it's, it's really the only one I know of. But I meant what I said earlier. You don't have to use something like this. I mean, just write down your stories um, because they are powerful and you'll remember them. But if you want to use this, reach out to me and we'll make it available. My colleagues will make it available to you if you have questions. We'll will help you. We've got an incredible digital team that does this stuff. Um, and you know that, that's, that's, that's my offer for, for better or worse. And Craig, we'd be happy to send that out. Uh, for, the, for the full group, we will send out um, not only information alerting you to the availability of the replay of this webinar, but also Craig's slides will be included uh, by link. And we can also put a link into the, to the matrix. So thank you so much. Craig, it's been such a pleasure. The information you shared has been remarkable and I know will be helpful to our entire audience. So thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, for, for all of our participants, I want to alert you that our next author series will take place on Wednesday, August 14th from 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time. We will feature Gary Schoniger, who is a co-author of Who Owns the Ice House. Uh, he's also the author of The Companion Force, Who Owns the Ice House, that is affiliated with the Kauffman Foundation, and we're delighted to welcome him. So thanks, everybody, for visiting with us this morning. Craig, thanks again. Folks, I know how busy everybody is. I really appreciate your time. You can tell I love this stuff. So please contact me if you have questions, okay? Everybody have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.